Shalom, shalom, friends. Wonderful to learn with you today, continuing our Sefer HaChinuch learning. We're going to look here at mitzvot uh, 307, 308, 309, and 404. So please uh, feel free to grab your book and learn with us. Feel free to post questions, post thoughts. Uh, Mitzvah 307 deals here with the mincha offering, the meal offering, uh, with uh, Shavuot, and it's learned from Vayikra 23.16. Mitzvah 308 is learning about uh, resting from work on Shavuot. And Mitzvah 309, this specific, Shalom La'asot Malacha B'yom Chag HaShavuot, this uh, prohibition against doing any type of work on Shavuot. Uh, 308 is learned from Vayikra 23.21, and uh, 309 from Vayikra 23.21. 15 to 16. And then lastly, Mitzvah 404 is learned uh, from Numbers, from Bamidbar 2826, about the Musaf offering, the special Musaf offering of Shavuot. And um, we learn here in Mitzvah 309 that this is about the 50 days, the 50 days from Pesach to Shavuot, um, that we're not only celebrating our freedom from, freedom from slavery, but also our freedom to, our freedom to actualize our destiny collectively as a people with our moral mission, our moral message of Kla Yisrael to bring light and redemption into the world. And so it says in Mitzvah 309, in the Sefer Chinuch, that we're looking at the 15 days of Nisan, the 29 uh, days in Iyar, and the six days of Sivan, getting us to 50, to the six of Sivan, to Shavuot. Uh, and so each day as we're counting the Omer, those who are counting the Omer, we are working up towards Shavuot associated with Matan Torah, with the receiving of the Torah. So the first question I want to ask is why is Pesach a week and Shavuot is only a day, right? We celebrate the leaving of Egypt for a week, but the receiving of the Torah you think would be most important for just a day? It's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, the Rambam, Maimonides, thinks it's a, it's a simple question that uh, to some degree it's a historical question of how much happened during those days. But he says the full impact, the Rambam says the full impact of Matan Torah, of the, of the giving of Torah, of revelation, really occurs in one day. It's really in this one day that this occurs. Um, whereas uh, uh, um, Pesach experience, the Geula, the redemption, happens in more days. But also he says Matzah, you can find yourself casually eating matzah over the course of a few days, the Rambam says. Now, I don't know what kind of life that is. That's not really my world, that uh, I'm going to casually find myself eating matzah for multiple days outside of Pesach time. But in the Rambam's world, he imagines we could be casually eating matzah for a few days, where he says, uh, so there we need to eat matzah for the full week to demonstrate this is something unique. We're not just casually eating matzah. We need to really be in this. Right, and so Matan Torah, but but Revelation, this is really a one day unique experience. But what I want to really suggest actually is that Pesach is most central. That what is most central about Passover is the notion that there is one God, there is one God, and our job is to live our lives emulating that God to bring redemption and liberation into the world. That's the Torah. That's the Torah. One God, emulate God to bring redemption to the world by liberating slaves, by liberating the captives, right? By bringing justice into society. That's the Torah. So why do you need the Torah to be revealed on Shavuot? We need the Torah to be revealed on Shavuot to sustain the message of Pesach, right? Because they lose that message pretty quickly. They're complaining in the desert. They're building a golden calf, the Egel Zahav, right? They're already losing the power of the miracles. So the Torah comes to reconfirm and reaffirm this message. But Pesach, we, that's the Ikar. That's the central bit. One God, emulate that God every day to bring justice into the world. Don't just say you believe in the Exodus because you close your eyes in your living room and say, I believe in the Exodus. I believe in the Exodus. It really happened. Rather, we demonstrate that belief in the Exodus by living each day in halach de bedrachav, imitatio day, emulating God's practice to bring justice to the world, to bring liberation to the slaves, 
to bring freedom to the captive. That's the role. And Shavuot, just one day, because we already have the message of the Torah. Now let's create a whole bunch of rituals and other things to sustain that belief and that spiritual consciousness. Now the Kli Yakar, the Kli Yakar asks the question of um, why doesn't the Torah even talk about Shavuot as being about Matan Torah, right? About revelation, right? The Torah could have said, Shavuot, stay up all night and study Torah because this is about revelation, but it doesn't. It doesn't. And the Kli Yakar wants to say that every day we celebrate revelation, every day we celebrate Torah, and so the holiday is not really about that. It's really not. And the Abarbanel, the Abravanel, says um, that's why this is about seeing our first wheat, right, our first crop emerging. Because there, when we experience the natural world, the blessing, then we, th- we, we, um, we pray out to God in gratitude for the bounty of our human existence. So in fact, this really is, for the Kliyakar and the Abarbanel, about the bounty of uh, in our lives and about gratitude. And later there's an idea of attaching revelation to this. Now, I find that kind of compelling because we're removed from our food sources today and sometimes removed from the gratitude of understanding what it is we have in our lives. Um, but, but I also don't find it compelling. It's like the notion of we don't need a Mother's Day because you should call your mother every day. We don't need an anniversary because you, lo- you should love your spouse every day. Okay, we should love her. We should love everybody every day. We don't need a birthday. Right? We, should, we should celebrate life every day. But there are such things as special, special times to focus in special ways on things. So uh, a Mother's Day is okay. An anniversary, a birthday, they're okay. Yes, we should celebrate every day, but there's a special time to do that. And so my response to the Kliyakar, in addition to the importance of his message and the Abarbanel, is that it's okay to celebrate Revelation one day, to grapple with Revelation and to, and to celebrate it as well. So, um, so, so uh, now I want to get to this, this question of why do we need Revelation b- Bichlal? Why do we need revelation at all if this is about conscience? Now, let me be clear. There are those in Jewish thought who think none of this makes sense. Just have faith, right? Forget reason and rationality, right? None of the Torah makes sense. We don't understand it. We're limited human beings. So just have faith and just do it all what it says. Don't worry about the reasons, right? That's a, that's a real strand in Jewish philosophy and Jewish tradition that's lasted for thousands of years. Um, and still is very strong today, uh, particularly in the Haredi community, in the ultra-Orthodox community. But for the strong Jewish tradition that actually we should make meaning, and there is uh, reason and revelation are compatible, um, and this is not merely irrational what we're doing, but attempting to be uh, a moral light in ways that we can grapple with and understand, um, then we have to ask the question, if this is a product of reason or compatible with reason, then what do you need revelation for at all? If we could have come to this ourselves. In fact, it says in Erevin, uh, in the hundredth page of Erevin, Erevin 100b in the Talmud, if we had not received the Torah, we would have learned modesty from watching a cat, honesty from the ant, and fidelity from the dove. What are they saying? That we would have learned the Torah inevitably right, that um, we, we, we could have learned this divine message without revelation, that we don't need leaps into the irrational. Natural morality, listening to reason and listening to conscience itself can be enough, right? So what do we need this revelation for at all? It's a big question. It's a big question for those of us who embrace reason. Now, of course, this notion that reason and revelation are compatible is found among many thinkers, just to name just a few of them, the Rambam, the Raubag, Gersonides, uh, Rav Sadia Goen, the Ibn Tibon, the Abra- Abarbanel. I mean, it goes on and on, and we're not even getting to modernity. And so once we say reason and revelation are compatible, the question is, why do we need revelation? And I want to offer six possible models as to how to think about that, the value of embracing Matan Torah, this experience of divinely given wisdom to the human realm. Now, let me be clear, this is not uh, the movie, The Ten Commandments. This is not some kind of cartoon of, um, of, you know, God, you know, this voice speaking out in some simplistic way. That Hasidut has taught us, Hasidic thought has taught us the depth of what Revelation is really about. That uh, they saw the sounds, right? Ro'et kolot. They saw the voices. 
And um, this is quite complicated. So here's six frameworks. The first one I want to offer is that revelation is reinforcing what we know. Revelation gives this pre-existing reason an authority and a force. It's true. Reason, we would think, would have force in itself, right? But it doesn't always, for various reasons of conformity and social norms. So revelation comes to reinforce what we already know, right? That's interesting. Second, a second possibility is that it's reframing. Revelation gives a person the opportunity to do something rational, but as a way of serving God, right? I'm not merely doing this act because it makes sense, but I'm now doing this as my avodas Hashem. I'm doing this as a way to connect to God, or one might say serve God, right? It's reframing what we know. A third possibility is concretizing. That revelation provides universal reason with particularistic content, particular stories, particular narratives, particular laws. A fourth possibility is that it's unifying. Revelation binds a people together into a community. Reason is isolating, right? We can come together to think, but it's within our heads. And revelation comes to unite us. It's a unifying force. A fifth idea is deciphering, that revelation rejects the relativism within the options of reason, that there's many choices that could be made that logic did not necessitate. Um, and, uh, and here we see that within the realm of possible choices, it enables us to decipher which among those. And lastly, but not least, evolving. Right, evolving. That revelation is needed to begin a process of rational transvaluation, which is to say that the rereading of text, the re understanding of values in our unique uh, cultures and time periods, uh, needs to take place to consistently provide new meaning and new application in various ways. So, revelation and reason are compatible. And revelation can reinforce what we know by reason. It can reframe. It can concretize. It can unite us. It can help us to decipher which aspects of reason to, to live by. And it, it provides a process of evolution. Now, uh, Ramban Nachmanides, in his commentary on Bhava Batra, page 12a, says uh, that this means that although prophecy was taken away from the prophets, right, uh, which is a vision, the prophecy of the scholars, Nevuat um, which is achieved through wisdom, was not taken away. Rather, they know the truth through divine inspiration, Ruach HaKodesh, um, that is still within them. Which is to say that there is an aspect that is lost today, right? It's true there's an aspect of revelation which doesn't occur, even though in a process theology, revelation continues. I'll post an interesting interview I recently had with the wonderful professor Tamar Ross. Um, but there's an other element of Ruch Kodesh that is still alive. That is to say, there's an external voice of revelation that emerges outside of us, and then there's an internal voice of natural morality, of conscience, uh, that emerges spiritually in our continued quest. The Ibn Ezra, in his commentary on Shemot 99, Exodus 19.9, says, at the time of the crossing of the Red Sea, there were individuals who were doubtful about prophecy. Even though the Torah writes they believed in God and Moshe, God's servant, and Israel saw that was not all the people. That is the reason, God says to Moshe, in order that the entire nation will hear me telling you the, the Aserah that he brought, the Ten Commandments, and they will believe in you as well, that you are my prophet. From that point onward, they recognize the, truths, the truth of Moshe's prophecy. So here we see this idea in the Ibn Ezra that Pesach wasn't enough. It wasn't enough for those miracles. We needed this unifying experience as, as a people. Now, that worked until modernity. In modernity, in the Haskalah, in enlightenment, when reason took us in new directions that didn't always seem to work with our understanding of revelation. And one of the challenges we see today among the diversity of Klal Yisrael, the Jewish people, is how fast should revelation continue to be reapplied? One camp says, reapply it at will. Anybody can do it. 
as they please, essentially, in ways that are meaningful to them. Another camp says, freeze it, freeze revelation. We need to put up more walls and more regulations. And I think there's some truth to both camps and some danger to both camps. In this middle space that is looking to preserve what has been revealed already, what have become the minhagim, the traditions and the customs, but also continue to evolve. Because halakha, right, what many translate as Jewish law, I would translate as progress. Halakha means to go forward, to, to walk, to progress, right? So it's rootedness, but a rootedness that continues to progress as well. Traditionalism, that is also a progressivism, right? Now, Rav Shagar is helpful here, the great postmodern Israeli uh, theologian and philosopher of uh, the 20th century. Here's what he says in Faith Shattered and Restored. It is a chapter, Justice and Ethics in a Postmodern World, page 116. He writes, To me, the creative act reveals the divine through the human. All truths may be the product of human conditioning, but such conditioning constitutes the medium through which the divine manifests in the world. That is why the pluralist believer does not shy away from using the revelation metaphor. Oh, you might say a pluralist. Revelation is about absolutism. I don't want it. But he says the pluralist believer does not shy away from using the revelation metaphor. Though he knows there are varying and conflicting revelations, uh, the contradictions do not paralyze him. He is willing to concede that truth is a human construct because he knows that human constructs are true creations, manifestations of God in a world that is filled with his glory. Not an empty, meaningless game. This Rav Shigar piece is very important, and I think this is a path forward for liberal Jews to take truth and theology and ethics very seriously and embrace a, 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 a relativism that empowers rather than paralyzes. Of course, we can't in the 21st century embrace some naive absolutism that we have the perfect truth uh, exclusive, exclusively and no one else does. But we also don't want a radical relativism that we have no notion of truth that we can embrace. A humility a humility which is uh, necessary religiously, that we don't hold the full truth and the flaws of our understanding of truth, and yet a, a, a courage to embrace the truth as we best can understand it. And that's why he's saying a pluralism where we embrace truth as we best can uh, as a human construct, but is nonetheless a, a, a manifestation of divine revelation, that these constructs are true creations, they're manifestations of God in the world. But this revelation perhaps was a concession. Perhaps reason was enough. If you look at the Sforno, the great Sforno says it is a concession. Why? The Sforno says kashrut, the laws of kashrut, kosher eating, is given because of egel zahav. It is because of the golden calf, the Sforno explains, that the laws of kashrut are given. Adam Harishon had this one command, don't eat from the tree. Eitzadat Tovara, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Then B'nai Noach, Noah, and the children of Noah only had these seven, the Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach. It's not until, it's not until Sinai that we come to get all of these mitzvot and perhaps that itself was a concession. Nonetheless, that's the reality of the world we live in today. And it is our responsibility, I believe, as Jews to continue to keep that revelation alive. That as we move from Pesach, the holiday of the realization that there's one God, and our job is to emulate that God in bringing justice into the world, liberation for the oppressed, and then, and then Shavuot comes, these 50 days later, we're working, counting the Omer, working each day in ourselves to grow spiritually and morally in our consciousness that we have one life, one life to actualize our potential, to bring godliness down into this world, to bring light into the darkness and to redeem the captives in the world, that that is our job, our job to bring this redemption into the world. And now that we understand this on Pesach, we now arrive at Shavuot. We arrive at Shavuot with the understanding that these of these miracles are what we need to emulate 
to each day live with a radical amazement, a consciousness of our role of emulating God and bringing redemption into the world. And now that we have this understanding based upon the Passover consciousness and based upon our reason and natural morality and our conscience, our job is now to intertwine that with the revelation of Sinai. However we understand Sinai, Har Sinai, the notion that divine morality is interconnected with our human conscience, our human conscience, and our human reason, based upon all these reasons we explored of the role of revelation to the person of reason. And so I give us all the brachas, we're approaching Har Sinai, that we embrace, we embrace it both with skepticism, the humility of not knowing absolute truth, but also with the courage to say that we have a mission in this world. We have a mission in this world to take the truth as we understand it, the moral truth, and to live every day with that moral truth fervently. A Judaism that is lived with passion and with fervency in the world, even as we hold a skepticism. Because the problem is we go one direction or the other. Either we go to an absolutism, which is chutzpahdik, a chutzpahdik that I have the absolute truth. And there's a lot of fervency there. You look at the fervency of that world. But then there's also the lost passion of the radical relativism that we don't hold any truth. We completely have decided there is no God or there is no revelation or that revelation is of no need to me as a 21st century American, right? And this middle camp is where we need to be to hold on to our skepticism, right? Which is, which is very holy, very holy to live with doubt as Rev. Cook taught but also to live with the fervency of revelation standing at Har Sinai. May we have the bracha as Klau Yisrael to continue to hold on to the past revelation and continue to receive revelation today from the Torah, from the voice of God, from the voice of our soul, from the voice of our learning, from the, from the face of the other, right? Channeling Levinas, the revelation that occurs in the encounter with the face of another human being encountering the person who is poor, who is struggling, people we love and people we don't love yet, and encountering their hearts and souls and the concrete face of the other. May that bring revelation into our lives and may we live fervently as Jews, bringing the light of the Torah and fervently as human beings today to do our unique role to bring liberation to the world. May we approach Shavuot with this radical moral and spiritual consciousness. God bless.